weird name. But <laughs> where did you grow up? That's my question. So yeah. You're clearly not from around here. I was, I was born in Northern California to my mom's like a hippie and my dad's like a redneck. So I'm like a red hippie. Now, when I hear California, I think surfers, like the beach. Is that California? No, no. I am from a, a – there's a part of California that wants to secede and start their own state called the state of Jefferson. And that's a bunch of rednecks up in the north, and we don't have anything to do with them southerners in the south. Now, I've actually come across some documentaries about <laughs> this part of California. Jefferson is, State. <laughs> let's just say people go there and don't come out. Yep, that's true. That's, uh, that, yo, that's true. That's, uh, there's a documentary called Murder Mountain. That's yep, where that's, I'm from, actually. That's where you're from. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, not on Murder Mountain, but like but that area, like maybe like Kidnap Valley, you yeah. know, like I, uh, you told me to watch it. <laughs> I watched it on Turner and went. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. Basically, yeah. like everybody just sells drugs. That's yeah. Pretty that's, much. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just thought I'd ask. Some you are story. nicer than others. So, yeah. So yeah. just throwing yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, if you've heard Blake's testimony, you know that that was part of his childhood. But <laughs> when I ask you anything. I, I know that you've shared with me you had an interesting hobby with your dad. Yeah. Uh, we, we, well, we had a lot of interesting hobbies, but one of the legal ones was uh, bear hunting, you know? Okay. Yeah, so he was, a, he was a bear hunting guide, and we would uh, take people from all over the world, not koala bears, too cute, and they're actually marsupials, so okay. chill. Um, but these were like big black bears, you know? Um, and... People from Saudi Arabia, from Korea, from New York, you know, from all over the place they would come and we would, uh, we would go bear hunting. We would take them bear hunting, you know. Oh, the, actually, the current king of Saudi Arabia, who was prince back then, he used to come and uh, my dad didn't eat pork, so he would only ride in my dad's car. It's, dad's a weird guy because he didn't eat pork but also grew weed, so it's like a blend there, you know. Yeah. He's on, he was on a journey. We all are. Yeah. And um, anyway... The, the prince, every time he shook his hand, he had a $100 bill in his hand or a $100 note. I know we're in Australia. So, but it was a bill over there. So $100 every time. And so my dad was like, hey, you going, prince? You know, and, uh, and he would only ride in his car. And so it was a good, I don't know if I, sh is that bribery? Maybe I, I don't know what just happened right. there. P positive vibes. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, was your dad trying to do this? Something you had to get a certificate for? Or was it? <laughs> No? Okay. We'll no. Leave it there. All right. No. <laughs> All right. He was, uh, his training was being raised by seven older brothers. Yep. And my dad was crazy. Like, he had his own trap in line when he was in third grade. Like, he made about $4,500 a month and supported his family back in the 60s. Trapping. From trapping beaver and bobcats and foxes and all sorts of stuff. And he sold the furs to the Russians and the Chinese. So, sorry. Just, but only like... That was a winter job. He, had, he did other yeah. stuff when stuff grew in the summer. Yeah. So, you know. But first job one night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, now, just last question. How old were you when you killed your first bear? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I was 14 years old, but I had, I had been bear hunting since I was three years old. Actually, if you count in the womb since then, but the okay. first one that I remember and the first one that, like, was official when I was three, and then every year... We were always taking people out, and, and my dad used me. I was, I've always been a big boy, so I was a bit of like a pack horse, and so when we'd kill something, he'd throw it on my back, and he'd say, I'll meet you at the truck. And I was like, truck is like 10 miles away, and he's like, I trust you, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I would cry my way back to the truck, yeah. you know, okay. so. <laughs> we'll <laughs> shelve that and deal with that in counseling. Yeah, we, we yeah. definitely okay. will, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, good to know. Yeah, and so anyway, when I was 14... We went to the Wild Mad River, or Wild Mad Country, uh, where the Wild Mad River runs. That's what it's called. Up in, uh, right near Murder Mountain, actually. It's on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, Wild Mad Country and then Murder Mountain. Uh, and anyway, we went up there. We were hunting, and we were, it was me, my dad, uh, my mom, and my sister were actually in the car. But they were just reading books because they're vegetarians. And um, you may know some in this area as well, too. Vegetarians are people, too, I've been okay. told. Um, and so anyway, we, we were uh, hunting, and we were with this other guy named Grizz. So Grizz, and he looks exactly the way that his name sounds. Yeah. I just want you to picture <laughs> whatever that is, that's exactly how Grizz looked. And anyway, we hike up all these mountains. Like, uh, the way that you hunt a bear is there's tracks in the snow, right? 
And then when you find the track, you, you get the dogs out of the dog box. I know some, I see some dog boxes of people who hunt pigs and stuff. It's similar, right? But they chase these bears, and the bears either go up in a tree or in a cave or whatever they do, wherever they go. Normally, they go to a tree. And as they get into the tree, the dogs change the way they bark. So instead of like a, hur, 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 you know, it's more like, oh, like the howl when he's up in the tree. When you hear the treen, that's what it's called, you get to the tree as fast as you can. So we're like hustling down, trying to get to this tree. And then it's this huge, huge tree. And it's probably like where that speaker is, is that first big branch. And uh, we're on a hill that's super steep. And, and we get to where the tree is. The dogs are all barking. And, and I, have my, I got my 308. And I'm, uh, this is like the first time that I'm doing it for me. And the bear's up in the tree. And I, my dad's like, you got to shoot this thing. And I was like, I recognize the fact that I have to shoot this thing, and I'm going to do my best, but there's a lot of things going on in my head right now. I didn't say any of that. I just said, okay, but that was what I was thinking. And then I look up, but then the scope cover was on the scope, but he was literally this far away from me. It was actually more like, it was literally just like this. So that's the, the bear right here. That's the branch, and I'm looking up, and then I look at my dad, and I said, the scope cover's on, and then my dad said things that I can't say because I'm a pastor now. But it led me to go, okay, I will do the thing that you just told me. That's what I, yeah. but we won't say what he said. Honk. Yeah, yeah honk. Lots of honks. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just looked, I was looking at him, looked back at the bear, and then looked at him and pulled the trigger, right? Because yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. And uh, the bear fell down like this. <laughs> like, and I was like, ah, you know. And then, but when it hit, the dogs jumped on it, and then they all rolled down the hill together. Then Grizz looking like he did. He ran down. This is a little violent story, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. I really apologize. But Grizz ran up, three in the head, you're dead, it's over. So just with a pistol. And you were 14. And I was 14 at the time. And so I was like covered in bear blood. Yeah. And then my, because like when you shot it, the blood just like all over me. And then my dad was like. Sorry, kids. (laughs) Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. You asked me this story. Yeah. Cordial, cordial. (laughs) So then my, my dad, like afterwards, he just like came and he was just like, wiped the forehead like Simba yeah. and yeah. he was like you are a man That's you right. know and I was like yeah. yeah and that was it yeah did you need a hug and cry you good yeah yeah okay Thanks. let's yeah sorry. we'll talk about that later <laughs> yeah. yeah and that that was yeah and then he made me pack the whole thing out again but by that time I'd already packed enough bears out I was like I was fine yeah. let's do this thing so yeah. and I got a bear claw necklace from that still cool yeah so okay sorry. well that's that a really not the direction I was thinking we were going to go no. but yeah yeah <laughs> so I think we can re- all relate to that childhood. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, normal upbringing, I think, in yeah. general. Australians so. is, is what we do all the yeah. time. It's, it's fun. <laughs> Actually, I remember when I first came, talking about Australians, the first time I came to Australia, some weird things were said to me. Someone asked if I wanted to have, uh, how they say it? They're like, oh, yeah, you're coming to tea this avo. And tea. I was like, first off, I don't really do the whole tea English thing, because I didn't know what that was, mm. and I was like, that's not really, I like iced tea, and secondly, I don't think avocados are going to go good in it, like I think it's a bad choice to put the avocados inside the tea, and I really want to advise against it, and then, so that was my first understanding that that meant afternoon and dinner, so tea means dinner, apparently. The other thing, they kept, all the Australians were like, oh mate, you got to watch out for the drop bass, and I was like, I will kill them, <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, we never heard that before. Yeah, you know? That didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, literally, like, where are they? Let's go. Let's do this. So yeah. it's a kind of a different approach. Yeah. So you're ready. <laughs> well, that's a perfect segue into the Bible. So let's yeah. pray. Yeah, let's pray together. <laughs> All right. Dear Father in heaven, we uh, just ask that you'll bless us, ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us, and uh, yeah, just thank you, Lord, for, for all the blessings in our life, the beautiful mm. weather, this beautiful location. And we just, uh, we just praise you, God, for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Sorry, Dan, I don't know if that was the direction you thought that was going to go. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, just be careful when you ask me stories. That's all I can say. All right. We are going to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. This is part of the recipe that we've talked about, right? We've, we've seen the recipe, rejoice, persevere, and pray. This is the recipe for peace that Paul is giving us, and we see this here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, and I got some stories that I want to share with you. They don't involve killing bears, um, 
They could. We'll, we'll see where the Spirit leads, but I'm pretty sure we're not going that direction this morning. Uh, I want to just say, when we talk about the word rejoice, it is a, it's a difficult word when you think about having to do something all the time, no matter what it is, even if it's a good thing, to do something consistently can be very, very difficult. I am, um, that's my sweat towel, sorry, <laughs> didn't realize that was there. Uh, one thing that I'm really consistent at is inconsistency. Can anyone relate? I'm consistently inconsistent. Very, I mean, like, every day, inconsistent. And it's something I really struggle with because I'm very, so uh, I have ADHD. My brain works, well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it does strange things. Uh, and I'm very impulsive. And so I'll see something or do something, and I'll, like, it's very much like those, uh, those cartoons where a dog is, like, looking at something and it's like, squirrel, you know? Like, I, I actually struggle with that all the time. Um, I think, actually, my wife struggles with it more than I do. Um, <laughs> but I'm the one that has it, so I don't know how to process that. But yeah, anyway, when we talk about rejoicing in the Lord always, I I want us to understand what the word rejoice actually means, and I want us to understand how we can do this consistently, okay? Uh, By the way, I just want to say before we even get into anything else, big shout out to my boys in the back, the AV team. I just want to give them a round of applause. Um. You guys are the problem solvers that you've fixed. Like, I'm looking at this. I don't have a neck strain anymore. Like, I, I, it looks like I know what I'm talking about now. You guys are making me look good. I appreciate it. You got the sound working. Thank you so much. So the, the AV guys are always, like, so undervalued. And I just, I, I, I know how valuable they are because I've done a church plant. We're going to talk about that later on. I was the AV guy and the speaker at the same time. And I would run back and forth, and I was like, I love AV guys. And gals, if you want to join as well, too. So if that's a future that you want to tell, go talk to AV team afterwards. But really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Now I got this sweet keyboard as well, too, so I can like go back and forth like that. It's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. ADHD focus. Okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about the word rejoice. It occurs 199 times in the Bible. I'm not sure why it didn't get in there 200 times, you know, but it's just like, we're stopping right here. Like 200 is just too much, right? But 199. In the Strong's G5463, uh, this is called Cairo. Did I say it right? Okay, he's thinking, okay. Dan's my, Dan's my Greek guy. This is how it's used in the Bible. To rejoice, to be glad, to rejoice exceedingly, to be well, thrive, in salutations or a hail, at the beginning of letters to give one a greeting and salute. Like, it's used for a lot of things. This Cairo word is used all over the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's a verb, and it really means to be cheerful, but the, the, the crux of it all is to be calmly happy. And that's really difficult for me, to be calm in general. Um, I'm usually over-the-top, hyperbolic, ridiculous, you know, outlandish. Those are words that describe me. American. I've literally had people write to the conference office complaining that I am too American. <laughs> and I agreed. I was like, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not just T-O American. I'm T-O-O American, like too American, right? And so, but when I think about this word to be calmly happy, that is the essence of the word rejoice for me. This kind of, when you think of the word calm, you think of like peace, relaxation, the calming deep breath. And when you think of happy, you think of, you know, excited smiles, you know, you're enjoying yourself, you're having a good time. So rejoicing is this deep realization that it's all good, right? That's a rejoice. It's, it's. It can be this overwhelming, yeah, rejoice, rejoice. That's what we think. But when you look at the word at the depth of what it is, it's more of this peace that passes all understanding, right? This idea that no matter what happens, it's all good. 
But I have a question for you. Rejoice in the Lord always? How are we supposed to always be joyful? How are we supposed to be cheerful? How are we supposed to be calmly happy always? I, you know, great example. You saw what I looked like in the morning when I wake up, right? Back when I had hair. And uh, it's very difficult in certain situations to actually rejoice. Can, I, can you guys relate to that? Or are you guys just like, easily, I rejoice all the time, no problem, right? No, there's some things in our life that are really hard. And they're a struggle, and they are difficult. And, and the reason being is because of sin is in the world. God created a perfect, beautiful environment that there wasn't this pain and suffering that took place every day all around us. And when sin entered the world, our situation, our lives became significantly more difficult. And I know that you can relate. Each and every one of you have experienced pain in your lives. Pain from your parents, pain from your kids, pain from relatives or neighbors or strangers or employees, uh, employers. Pain comes from all these different painful relationships that happen. And, and so we don't want to pretend that those things aren't happening because it's real and we need to recognize that. So let me tell you a little story of a time that I graduated so I came over to Australia from America, and I have a degree in social work. But when I got here, Australia said, we don't accept your degree. And I was like, okay, that's a bummer. You know, that's, that's sad. So I was very upset about the fact that I just spent like four and a half years of my life trying to get a degree, and then it was rejected, you know. And so when I talk, I've got a lot of uh, Indian friends or African friends who've come over, they're like doctors, but they're not recognized here in Australia, and they're working as like support or AIN workers, and I, I have a lot of, I, I recognize that pain. Like you put all, like, all this energy and effort, but you can't work doing what you're qualified to do. It's very painful and very frustrating. So anyway, come over here. I, I, uh, that, that doesn't work, so then I become a lumberjack, because that's just the obvious choice, right? You just, if you can't do social work, lumberjacking. That's the next step, or, or you guys call it a tree lopper. Did that for a little while. Uh, then I did support work for uh, children with disabilities, um, and I got a lot of crazy stories in that world. Uh, and then finally I decided, uh, I did homeschool with my, my son, actually. He, he was having some reading disabilities, some learning disabilities, so we did homeschool for two and a half years while I was lumberjacking, you know, uh, and doing some support work. And then I realized I want to be a teacher. So I went to Avondale, and I got my primary education degree, and I was a primary school teacher. And so when I graduated with that degree, uh, I was offered some different jobs in different places, uh, but we knew some friends who lived in Perth. And so we flew all the way from Sydney, all the way across uh, the, great Vic, the Great Victoria Desert, I guess that's what it's called right there. And we landed in Perth, and we started a brand new life uh, where I had a, a nice job, and we got a new house. It was, it was exciting. Like, it was like kind of a, a fresh start. This is me teaching, an exact replica. Uh, this is the exact blueprints of our house there in Perth. And uh, everything was just good. I had a new job, I had a new house, I had a new city that I was in, exploring new friends, new life, new salary, that was really good. And rejoice always, it was easy, we had it all. We had everything, so of course I could be calmly happy. Of course I could rejoice, because everything was just there, like positive vibes only, because that's all that was necessary, right? And uh, we had this happy little family, that's uh, me on the left, my wife, She's from Africa, that's why. Um, she's on the right there. Uh, my daughter, Misper, and then our son, uh, Malin, as well, too. It's an exact replica of exactly what we looked like in Perth. We were happy. We had a good life. We enjoyed. There's a lot of... My, my family is vegan, and then there's me. Uh, but they, uh, they had all these vegan restaurants in Perth that they were trying to bring me over to the other side, you know? And I was happy. Like, I was like, vegan food is good. I, we can do this, you know? 
I was sneaking a few hamburgers, but not as many because of the vegan. So, okay. so we, had, we were having a good time. And the reason we are happy is because happiness depends on what is happening around you, right? Happiness depends on what's happening, happening around you. You, of course, you're going to have a good time when you're having a good time because that's what's happening around you, right? And then there was a phone call that changed my life. And that was when I learned the difference between joy and happiness, because there is a difference. All right? I want you to understand that joy is actually from the Lord. Joy, unlike happiness, is independent of what's happening around you. There's a, very, there's a different there. Happiness requires happening, right? Joy independent. No matter what happens, you can still have joy. While happiness depends on what's happening, joy is from within and can only be given through Christ who strengthens you. We talked about this at the end of Philippians 4. And Psalm 1611 uh, from the New Life Version says it beautifully, you will show me the way of life. Being with you is to be full of joy. So according to the word of God, how can a person have joy? Being with God. When you are with God, you have joy. So, let's just process this for a minute. If you are with God and you lose your legs, can you have joy? Now, you're going to have pain, but you can still have joy. Being with God and you lose your house to a fire, can you still have joy? Because does joy come from the house, or does it come from being with God? Right? Now, some of you are like thinking, oh, you know, This is kind of, I don't know what to say. Is he tricking me? Like, what is he trying to do here? Absolutely. I I want you to know that no matter what happens in life, when you are with the Lord and you allow him into your life, you can have joy regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what is happening around you. So that phone call was, it was a phone call from my mom. To give you a little background, my dad has had cancer three times in his life. Once before I was born, don't want to get into the details of it, but it was, uh, I don't even know what to call it. I don't, can I say that word in a sermon? I'm not going to say the word. But the man bits. Is that, an, is that an okay word to say? The two man bits under the other. Anyway. I don't know. Starts with a T, ends with, yeah, okay, cool. So he had that kind of cancer before I was born. And then two became one, okay? And then after that, I was born a few years later, because two became one, my parents, of course, yeah. Um, so then I was, I was born, and then 25 years later, my dad had the same cancer again, right? So, but on the other one, that was the leftover one. And then one became none right? And then gone, right? Yikes. And we thought he was going to get better. And then he got the same cancer again, but on his spine. So that's how manly he was. I just want to throw that out there like, he's still getting the T cancer without the T's, right? (laughs) Like that's like hair on the chest, moonshine kind of papa. Okay, anyway, sorry. So he, uh, the third time he got it, things escalated back because it was on his spinal cord. And so he decided, uh, he'd, he'd done everything naturally before or as, as much as possible. But anyway, whatever happened was he had this toxicity from the chemotherapy. He finally did chemotherapy. And uh, he had this thing called bleomycin toxicity, and it basically deep fries your lungs. It turns them into like fried chicken, like it just... <laughs> and so he basically was drowning to death by his own lungs, and he needed a lung replacement from the toxicity, and his body was attacking itself. I got a phone call. My mom was like, you got to get over here as soon as you can. We had just moved to Perth. I was maybe working maybe for probably two and a half months at the most, maybe just two months. Didn't really have the money because we just spent all the money moving over, right? Um, And But praise the Lord, uh, there was a family, the Max family back in Kurumbong. I don't know if you know them, Janine and Clinton Max. They probably won't even want me to tell you this, but they're not here. Tough luck. 
um, and they paid for my ticket to, draw, to fly. Like, they bought a ticket within like six hours, and, they, and I flew uh, over to America. Now, on the way, I stopped in this place called uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, or Dubai. I, I hope that's the same place. If, it, if it's not, I really apologize. But it was in that region. It was Dubai. And um, we had to do a layover, and we, we stopped, and we were there. And I met this refugee from, I believe it was from a place called Kuwait. Anybody heard of Kuwait? Okay, so that's a real place. That's good. That's, that reminds me that uh, that's where I think he was from. And we talked about all the, the desert storm and all the different battles that had gone on in his life and why he was a refugee. And we, um, we were eating at an all-you-can-eat Middle Eastern buffet in Dubai. I want to say premium stuff there, okay? Falafel, Yeah. So we're eating, we're talking, uh, and he's flying back uh, to see his family, I think, as well, too. And we just start talking about religion. We, he, he's uh, Muslim, and I was Christian Seventh-day Adventist at that time. And he noticed that I didn't eat any pork. And he was like, why don't you eat pork? You know? And I was like, oh, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he was like, a seventh what? I was like, and I, I was like, perfect opportunity. So we share, I shared my testimony. I talked with him, I talked about the Bible, I talked about the Word of God, I talked about uh, Jesus, and he shared some things from the Quran, things about the, his Muslim religion, and as we talked, we just made this super deep connection, and I really challenged him on looking into prophecy, right? Because prophecy is why, because I was like, why do you believe in the Quran? And he, uh, the Quran? And he was like, because of Muhammad, and I was like, and he was like, why do you believe in the Bible? And I said, because of prophecy. He's like, what do you mean? So we go over Daniel 2. You know, we go over Daniel 7, and we just got deep into it. Like, we were there for about five hours together just talking. And um, I believe that some seeds were planted, because afterwards he said, I've never heard a Christian talk like you. He said, I've never met a Christian that didn't drink alcohol, right? I've never met a Christian who understood the scriptures and actually talked about the scriptures like I talk about the Quran, Right? And so this would have never happened had I not been on this journey. And I believe that truly seeds were planted in his life. Anyway, we continued flying. He went separately. I went to another place. And then I landed in San Francisco, California. Uh, that's California, the Golden State. And then we came over here and we drove for five hours up to Red Bluff. This is me driving on the wrong side of the road and then realizing I'm back in America. I've been back on the other side of the road. And uh, it took five hours and when I got there, it was 2 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I want to tell you, I drove, it was a two-seater car. And I mean that. It was really like a one-seater. But my grandma picked me up, and it's like one of those smart cars that you plug in. But the, it's shorter than my body, okay? <laughs> and we, I was sitting like this for five and a half hours driving up, and my grandma was like, I'm real surprised you even fit in here. And I was like, me too, Grandma. <laughs> um, and she was like, this is the fastest I've ever driven this car, you know? And we were flying. So anyway, we're driving up the freeway, up I-5. We go to Redding, California. And my dad is here at the Mercy Medical Center in Redding. Problem is, it's 2 a.m. Everything's all locked up. The only way to get in is through the emergency room, right? Now, how do I say this correctly? We need to go back. When I, was in, when I was in school, I learned how to sneak out of class. Um, in college, another part of my story, I actually learned how to sneak into class. And then at the hospital, I learned how to run from security guards, Okay. <laughs> So I, I, I snuck in. They were telling me that busy hours are over. I was like, not for this guy. And I got in. I busted through, ran up these stairs, took another ele elevator, went over to the side, came back through to the ICU unit, ran into where my dad was. And I got there before they could even get to me. And I just sat down, talked to my dad, and I told him, hey, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to be here to help take care of everything. I'm, I'm, I just want to let you know. He was so surprised. Didn't think I was going to come whatsoever. And I'm, I'm sitting there, uh, I sit right next to him, I'm holding his hand, and he's talking to me, I'm talking to him, and we're just talking about, we're talking about the stuff that you talk about when you know you're not going to talk about stuff ever again. You know what I'm talking about? That stuff. And we're holding, we're holding hands, but not like 
holding hands were like man hold hands, you know, like boom, you know. It's the only way you would hold hands, right? So we're just boom, holding it. And then and we have this prayer, and I got to say that that was probably the most powerful prayer of my whole life up to that point, maybe even still. And in this prayer, we just, both of us just poured our hearts out to God and to each other. And, you know, when the security guards came finally to come get me, they, they actually just let me stay, and they're like, well, you're already in here, so whatever. And because uh, I was like, I told them, I was like, you can try to move me, but it's going to end badly for everybody in here. And they're like, yeah, that's probably true. So uh, then they left, and then I was there. I was probably there for probably two hours, you know. And then finally, my dad was like, okay, this is good. You got to go. Get some rest. I'll, you know, I'll see you in the morning. And that was the last time I ever talked to my dad. Um, he didn't die, but because of the bleomycin toxicity, he had a tracheotomy. And then for another probably two and a half weeks, I was still there, and he was writing. But the problem was because of the bleomycin toxicity, his oxygen saturation kept going down and down and down. So he, whereas he used to be able to write, he couldn't even function anymore, and his brain just deteriorated slowly more and more and more. Um, so I'm there for about two and a half weeks, and uh, over uh, in Hayfork, California, where my, he's my best friend, but I call him my brother. His name is Christian. He grew up in Hayfork. I grew up in like Round Mountain, and then we, uh, I lived at his house in the summer. He lived at my house during the school years. Anyway, he had a house in Hayfork, and he wanted me to come up and see his family because they were kind of like my family as well too. And so while we're up there, there's this, we were staying over at his in-laws, and there was this uh, girl, I can't remember her name exactly. I think her name was Jackie, if I'm not mistaken. I actually think it is. And she had just kind of, left home. Uh, I think she was maybe 20 years old, and she was really in a spiritual crisis in her life. Her biological father um, had mistreated her very poorly. She didn't know what to do with her life. She was just kind of an emotional mess. And so we, we talked. We did some counseling, but we also talked about who Jesus was, and we talked about the gospel. And she, in that moment, right there in front of the fireplace, she, we got on our knees together, and, and she prayed uh, to accept Jesus into her heart. And, and then I, I learned later on, she started to attend church. She started doing Bible studies after I left. And that would have never happened had I not been in Northern California at that time. Now, I was there for terrible reasons, but God still worked some amazing good things out of it. Romans 8.28 reminds us, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I want to tell you, in the moment, it's very difficult to see the truth of that Bible verse. But it's a promise. There's power in the promises of God. There is power in the promises of God. That's my dad. I showed this picture and Dan was like, I know this guy, I see him on the internet. And I was like, no, that's my dad. And he was like, what? You know? So that's him, gold mining. Um, he was into that. He was into a bunch of stuff. But that was one of the things that he was into. And uh, in the book of education, which is probably my favorite book by Egg White, or E.G. White, or Ellen G. White, uh, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. And I want to say, my dad did not grow up a Christian, but in his later years, this man was truly a follower of the Lord. Uh, in the morning, he would, he would wake up and he would just spend sometimes hours in the Word of God, like charging for his day, ready to go, whether he was gold mining or going hunting or, or what he, fishing. He was always outdoors, but he, he would always take that time to plug in and to charge up for the day through the Word of God. And, and I can say this as well, too. He had a very colorful life. 
and we did not have a good relationship growing up at all. Like it was, think of a good relationship and then whatever the opposite of that, that was us. We were the exact opposite of people. And we struggled with each other. We fought each other emotionally, mentally, physically. It was a, it was a rough go. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, I met Malvinus. That's a whole other story. Malvinus is my wife. I realized that the relationship I had with my father, it wasn't right. It wasn't good. There was something wrong with it. And so I actually called him up, and I said, <laughs> I said, you know, Dad, I, I want to press restart. You know, we've got a lot of history, and there's no way that we're going to overcome some of the stuff we've done to each other. And they were, both of them were bad. So... But I said, I'd like to restart because I'd like to restart with Jesus in my life. And he, at the same time, was having a spiritual transformation at the same time. It's funny how the Holy Spirit works all the way across in different countries, you know. And uh, this, was, this was about four or five years before this time in the hospital. And uh, he, he just said, I want to do that too. And, and I want to tell you as well, he just started bawling his eyes out. Well, at least it sounded like that. Maybe he had a pre-recording. It was on the phone. I don't know. But he definitely, there was some, somebody was crying. I think it was him. Because uh, I'd never seen him cry before. I thought his, I think his tear glands were made out of some sort of granite. Um, and just like crystal salt cubes just came out before, you know. But now he was really crying. And I was crying too. Because when you see your dad cry when your dad's never cried before, man, the fountain works turn on. I've been crying ever since, actually. You know, I was like, what? I never cried before, but then since that time, I was like, if he can cry, I can cry too. Um, <laughs> anyway, and we, we pressed restart on our relationship, and we, we worked on being nice to each other. That's a key part. It takes work and effort, and we made decisions to choose to, to live differently, to choose to not use substances in our life. To choose to, because that substance just mess up every, all your thinking. To choose to follow God and to be uplifting towards each other. And our relationship, it changed. And I'm so thankful that I had those few years before the end. But after he passed away, I remember getting the phone call. I was up on the other side near Lassen. And when I got the phone call, I knew he had passed away that night I, in my heart. I don't, I don't know how to explain it because I was at the hospital the whole, all the time, but when I left to go eat or to, I went over to my, my buddy Eli's place to stay the night and as I was driving back, I was like, oh, I know he's gone, you know, and I got the phone call and I went back and, and he was. And I remember thinking about all the promises of the Bible and recognizing that they are alive and they're living and they are, they are self-fulfilling because God spoke the world into existence. This is why it's so important for us to believe as a church. Just I'm going to go on a little tangent here. I apologize. When do I have to finish? What time? I'm just looking. 12.30 is lunch. Okay, so 2.30, I will be done. All right, here we go. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I got I to gotta tell you this, so I don't know if you do this or not, but if you want to improve the likelihood of a child remaining a Christian into their adult life, you can increase the statistical likelihood that they will remain within the church by 80%. Is that a good number? 80%? If they believe in a six-day literal creation, 24-hour period, six-day literal creation. I don't know what you have taught or think or think about that, but the Bible says six days, morning and evening, 24 hours, literal creation. If you believe that and your kids believe that, you're 80% more likely to remain a Christian than if you don't believe that. That one thing can increase your ability to be a Christian by 80%. That's pretty good. And so God spoke and it was so. Six days, everything is created by his word. When you read the word of God, it is alive and self-fulfilling. It's a, it's a prophecy in and of itself. 
And in Romans chapter 12, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? When you read God's word, it has recreative capacity, recreative ability. As you're reading the scriptures, you have the Bible in your hands. That word, by reading it, you're speaking life into your own existence because the source of life is Christ. So as you read the word of God, those promises literally give you life because God's word has creative ability. He speaks and it is so. And so when you read the promises that God has for your life, you can cling to those knowing that those are true. They will be fulfilled. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has plans for your future, plans to prosper you. He wants to open the floodgates of heaven in your life. He is overjoyed that you are his child. These are promises that speak life into your very existence. So with your Bibles, I want you to turn, some of you are maybe already there, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. I'm going to turn there as well too. 1 Thessalonians. All the T's are in alphabetical order, just so you know. So if you find one T, you can find the others. Uh, well, if you know your alphabet. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. All right? Now, amen. Thank you, Dan. All right. Let me know when you're there by saying amen. Okay, perfect. And if you're not there, all you have to do is say, have mercy. We will wait for you. Okay? But I'll give you a little time. We had uh, my dad's memorial service at the Reading Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it was this passage of Scripture, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that, that I actually preached on at the church at his memorial. And I read it over and over again. Uh, and then after the memorial service, we kind of helped organize his you know, estate and those kind of things. After a person passes away, you've got to just sort all that stuff out. I helped my mom move houses. I helped my grandma move houses. It was just a wild time. And uh, then afterwards, I flew back uh, to Perth. So I was gone for probably about, I'd say roughly six, six and a half weeks, probably six weeks, the whole thing. Right when I get back, another phone call, another heartbreak. The same day I arrived back in Perth, over in Zimbabwe, they discovered that a tumor was growing in my mother-in-law's brain. So I literally land, I go to the house, we get a phone call, there's a tumor in Amai. Her name is Amai, well, in, Zim, in Shona, you say Amai for like your mother, mother-in-law. And so Amai had this tumor growing inside of her. And so my wife and my daughter, because she was very young, um, she went over to Zimbabwe. They flew uh, together over to Zimbabwe. Misper was uh, so young at the time that Malvinas just strapped her up. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but the Africans, they just have a baby, boom, put them on the back, out doing whatever they want to do. It's actually a super solid, effective maneuver. I, was, I didn't know it was a thing until I met my wife, and I was like, wow, you, you just have a bunch of babies. That's, that's crazy. Hands-free. Um, Anyway, that's another story. You can talk to her about that. But she was over there for basically another six weeks, and I was over with Malin. And so the day I get back, then she leaves. So now we're separated for almost basically 12 weeks, you know? And Malin and I uh, were just living the, the bachelor life uh, of... We're bad at cleaning things, let's just say that, okay? And... Um, also, we're bad at cooking things. Yeah, there's a lot of, we're bad at doing laundry. We're, we're at a lot of house necessities, right? So the house was rough for six weeks. And uh, Malvinas is over there. She's caring for her mom. Now, my wife is a registered nurse, and so she had uh, a lot of skill in being able to, to care. She got her proper brain scans. They got a, a good prognosis. They had really good doctors on it and everything. And so after she basically sorts everything out to figure out what's going to happen, my wife and Misper, uh, they fly back. Uh, and they come and they land in Perth. And then another phone call and another heartbreak. 
Same day my wife arrived home to Perth after the six weeks from Zimbabwe, her mother passed away unexpectedly months before her prognosis. So then we all fly back to Zimbabwe. Um, And I got to tell you, we were just broke, right? Just even though the Max family helped us with the, the ticket on before, and I'm so thankful that they did, like we just poured every dollar into going and seeing our friends. We don't have any family in Australia, right? And so, but we do believe that God has called us to minister to the heathens here. Um, it's a missionary call, you know? A lot of secular people in, the, in this country. So it's a mission field. If you don't know it, go out your door, go down to the pub, go to uh, the Bottolo. There's a lot of mission possibility, a lot of mission work available. So this is crazy. I had just been to my dad's funeral, and there was a whole bunch of people I didn't know. It was like probably the biggest funeral I ever been to, my dad's funeral or his memorial service, because my dad didn't want to be buried. He wanted to be cremated and taken to the top of a mountain and then and, and let his ashes go. So thanks for making it as difficult as possible, Dad, but I still love you. Um, anyway, so we did the memorial service, but it was huge. Like all these people came, and they were, uh, they were just talking about how good my dad was, you know, to them. And, and You know, my dad did have a colorful background, but it's very interesting because he had a code, right? He definitely lived on the the edge or the fringe of the law, but he did what was right in his, you know, in his mind. And and what the law said was not always what he felt was the right thing to do, and the people that he hung out with knew that he had strong moral code of doing the right thing, right? I don't know how to explain that. It's like kind of like the cowboy code, I guess. And it was just this huge... Funeral with all these people who are just so uh, appreciative of my dad. And there was like probably like 200 plus people. It was just crazy. It was gigantic. When we flew over to Zimbabwe, it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. There was 1,000, maybe 1,500 people there, right? And what had happened was they were having a camp just like this, uh, but... The Africans actually properly have camp. Like, they just literally put a tarp up and everyone just sleeps, and it's crazy. So I was like, whoa. They bring the whole church camp to the funeral. There's at, l- at minimum 1,000 people. You just lose count. Like, it's just a sea of people. And um, I didn't know this, but Amai, uh, her name is actually Misper, which is my daughter's name. We named her after Amai. And um, uh, it's her namesake. And so... Amai was the Dorcas leader. Anybody heard of Dorcas? You guys kind of know what that is? Well, the way they do Dorcas in Africa is crazy cool. And it's an awesome idea. Like, I, I never thought about it before, but I love the idea. So this is what they do. They collect resources, everyone in the Dorcas, and then each month, like on a schedule, they buy a year or two supply of like rice and oil and sadza and which is like no one knows what it is actually but it's food that they eat i'm still it looks like play-doh i don't know yeah a mealy meal pop you call it pop yeah you know what i'm talking about colin uh whatever it actually is it's a thing that they consume i'm still trying to figure it out uh but anyway you you they bought all of these like a year supply for this person at the church And then they do it to the next person, the next person, the next person. And everyone would put money in, and she's the one who organized it. So when there were famines, and there was times like that, no one in church went hungry. And she was the one who took care of that. She sewed clothes. She got up at 4 a.m. to run a prayer meeting. 4 a.m., okay? Like, whoa. I can't even process that time. It's just like a real, that's a dark hour in my world, you know? And so she gets up. She's just like this woman of God. She is just a soldier of the Lord, fully. And she had nine kids, right? Whoa, you know. Uh, She was, and her husband was an atheist his whole life. And she she paid his tithe faithfully. (laughs) 
much to his chagrin. But he was like, no, she was like, the Lord will bless this house. You have to pay the tithe. He's like, I don't even believe in God. And she's like, he believes in you. Give me your 10%, you know. Um, and she's a convincing woman. Uh, but when, when her husband came to the end of his life, he had seen this testimony of her life, his whole life, and he asked for, he was too sick to actually uh, be baptized, but he asked for the elders of the church to come to anoint him, and he accepted Jesus as his Savior, and I believe he'll be in, in the kingdom of heaven. I get to meet him. He's going to be super surprised when the white boy shows up with the family. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be a wild time. Um, it's funny because I'm a, a Murungu, right? Murungu means like white, white boy or white man, but they call me Mutema, which, because my name is Blake, but they all say black. So I am the white man named black man, <laughs> right? So, and, and in this sea of people at Amai's funeral, I'm the only white Mutema everywhere. They call me Mutema, and it was really confusing to strangers, because the family had been calling me Mutema for years, but they're coming up to the one white guy in the whole place, and they're calling me Mutema, which means black man, and so everyone's like, what is going on, you know? And um, I pieced together a, a little sermon in Shona. Like I write down in Shona and I, and I, I do my best to, to speak their language and to, to, to do a sermon in their language for, uh, for a Mai. And this is before, I, was, I wasn't a pastor at this time, by the way, as well, too, um, but I just volunt- I always preached anyway, uh, and I think God was trying to call me and tell me to do ministry later on, which it, I ended up doing. But we're at this, this funeral, and there's just thousands of people, and I'm doing my best to speak in Shona, which is their language, and I just realized that it only takes one person to make an impact on all these people. And then think about the networking of that, how many how much impact will each one of those people have on other people as well too? And it was because this woman was faithful to the promises of God. Even when her own husband said, don't believe in that rubbish, she said, I will believe and you will pay, you know? She was faithful to God above man. Regardless of her circumstances, this woman was a woman who rejoiced always. She was calmly happy. She fully recognize the difficulty of our circumstances. And I just want to say, too, I know there's a couple of Africans here. I see an African there. I see an African there. You guys are a little less tan than other Africans. But Africa is a tough place to live. It's a no-joke zone, you know? It is, the life expectancy in Africa is far, far less than many other countries. It's dangerous. It's dangerous no matter what color you are, whatever your background is, it's a rough land. And some people even say, that the reason the dirt is so red in Africa is because it's stained with the blood of people who have lost their lives. And they have this tradition <clears throat> in Africa where the Makwashas, uh, well, this is in Zimbabwe, I don't know about South Africa, but the Makwashas, which are essentially son-in-laws, I think, I don't really know if it means that, but they call me that, and I am a son-in-law, so I'm just like guessing this is probably what it means. It could be a derogatory term, and I apologize if it is. But I think it means son-in-law. And um, the makwashas are to bury the parent, right? The, the, especially the Amai, the mother-in-law. So she, they called her Maimeza. Meza is the surname, and they usually say Mai and then whatever name it was. So Maimeza, um, our job is to bury her in this red dirt. <clears throat> so we have the funeral. There's thousands of people around. And it's the Makwasha's job. Everyone's standing solemnly, watching, not saying a word. Because it's this respectful moment. Me and the other Makwasha's, and she had nine kids, so there's quite a few of us working, working away. And we were putting the dirt and filling the dirt into, they had lowered the, the casket, and we were putting the dirt inside. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry, just going to take a drink and try not to cry as much as my dad did. <laughs> no big deal. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> just a frog in the throat. Emotions. 
Motion equals emotion. I'm moving. That's what's happening. Okay. So we're there, and I'm putting the dirt, and, and we're burying a mine, right? And then my daughter, she's, I don't know, she's still backstrap uh, age, whatever that age was. You know, she can get strapped up on the back. Uh, she looks at me, and then she looks down, and then she looks back up at me, and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, you know, Amai, she's lost her life. She's gone to sleep. Uh, and, and what you do is we're, we're burying her. We're, we're burying her. And she's like, but why are you doing that? And I was like, well, this is what you do when, when someone passes away. You bury them. And she's like, but when Jesus blows the trumpet, nothing's going to hold her down there. And I was like, yes, that's true. So she's like, you're wasting your time. And I was like... <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. And it was this profound moment of this, this faith that she had that, you know, we're all crying our eyes out, we're all emotional, we're upset, and yet it's this little child who says, why are you doing that? When Jesus blows the trumpet, nothing's going to keep her down there. You're wasting your time. And I want us to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, Thessalonians 4, verse 13. And we're going to read through this. There's some promises in here that are super important. This passage is a passage I have read many times, and it has, it has changed my life because there are promises in this, in this passage that will help you in some of the most difficult times of life, the most difficult times to rejoice. And this passage is a passage that can help you rejoice when your world is falling apart around you. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not or who have no hope. It's from the ESV. Through inspiration, God gave us this passage so that we could be clear that we don't have to wail and gnash our teeth and mourn because we are separated from those we are loved, the, 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 from our loved ones because of death. And to be clear, when he's saying about those who are asleep, we're talking about death. And as we continue in this passage, you'll see this even more, but Jesus himself talks about death as asleep in John 11 when he talks about Lazarus. In verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So those who die will be resurrected just like Jesus as well. In verse 15, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. You're wasting your time. When Jesus blows the trumpet, nothing's going to hold her down. There are some patriarchs and matriarchs, some powerful people who have followed the Lord, who have passed away. And when Jesus blows that trumpet, you better believe that you will be seeing them in the sky. And we will meet up with them. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. This is a verse, too, that's a promise that also helps us to recognize how not to be deceived. If someone says, hey, Jesus is in the desert, or Jesus is in Brisbane, or who is that one guy, the random guy up in Queensland? I don't know. Don't go because he's not actually there. If, this, is a, this should be very, very clear. If you don't see people floating, Jesus is not back. Okay? That's like clear. You don't have to turn the TV on. You don't have to check Twitter. You don't have to, you know, go on Insta to double check to make sure he's around. No, no, no. When you see people floating, you can be, you can rest assured, okay, 
Jesus is coming back. Okay, you can, and you'll see Jesus as well too. But the, the floating people should really kind of be the little kicker. That's like the one where you go, this is the real deal. That makes sense. And hopefully, by God's grace, you yourself will be floating as well too. Whether you have passed away or whether you're alive, the promise says that you will fly. I'm looking forward to that day because I'm a very grounded individual. I don't get up very high often, but I'm going to have like 50 meter vert, you know, maybe even higher. Who, who knows? Like long, long, long ways. I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to, there's another verse in, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 15, about the transformation in the twinkling of an eye. This is the verse I always reference when my wife wants me to go to the gym. <laughs> you just hold on, babe. Someday, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to look good. Just want to throw it out there. So if you're maybe struggling with that a little bit, you got a future body, primo. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that's probably my favorite verse of this whole passage. It's in reference to all the words that you've just read. Encourage one another with these words. When you see someone who is struggling to rejoice... When you see someone who is dealing with the pain of loss, when you see someone who is dealing with something that should never have been, because we weren't created to die, we were created to live forever. And some of us, as we get older and older in our journey, we recognize death is a lot closer. But this should help you to recognize and understand it's just a big old nap. You're just going to take a nap, and when you wake up, you're going to have a great bod, you're going to have your hair back, it's going to have color, and you're going to be in heaven for eternity with the Lord, right? Well, actually, a thousand years coming back, new earth, there's a whole different Bible study, but we'll be with the Lord from there on out. For me, I go to this verse all the time because I need to be reminded of these promises because it's the promises that make all the difference in our life. This is a little picture of what she looked like back at that time. She's up there, she doesn't know, which is probably good. Uh, isn't she cute? Like, she's super cute. I have no idea how this DNA did that. I have <laughs> miracles happen, that's all I can say. But she's just adorable. But it reminds me of this promise that Jesus, he says, allow the little children to come to me, do not forbid them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We need to have that kind of faith that says, you're wasting your time. <laughs> what are you doing? No matter how much cement, no matter how much dirt, no matter how much water, no matter what you do, nothing's going to keep God's children, the dead in Christ, in the ground. When Jesus blows the trumpet, that resurrection is going to happen. Whether you want to believe it or not, the truth is the truth, and that resurrection is going to happen. And we know this because of the promises. God, in his infinite wisdom, while he's still here on earth, I believe it's John chapter 14. Someone can check that for me if they want. But he says something to the, to the lines. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, rest assured I'm coming back. But he says that before he leaves knowing that he will go. And the, and the way in which he left would have left an impression upon the minds of the disciples and the apostles as well too, knowing that they saw him ascending up in, so the way in which he left, which is ascending up into the clouds, is the way he will return after he has prepared a place for us for eternity. So Jesus is a self, he's fulfilling the prophecy by his own actions. He's saying, before this happens, when this happens, you can believe that I'll be coming back. Because God's word is creative. When he speaks, it is so. Jesus is coming back. And that is something that we can rejoice about. We rejoice in the promise, which gives us the strength to persevere through the pain. I am not at all denying the fact that all of you have experienced pain in your life. 
it's real. We live on earth. It's hard. It's difficult. But through the promise, we can have the hope, the everlasting hope of a life with the Lord. And so when we are calmly happy, when we rejoice, we're rejoicing in the fact that the promise will be fulfilled. And the knowledge, the faith of that promise gives us the strength that we can then persevere through all the pain that the devil throws at us, the fiery darts of temptation, the struggles, the addictions, the resentment, the anger, the jealousy, the pride, the ego, the the issues of life. You can get through all of it. You can rejoice through all of it because of the promise that God gives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your character of goodness and faithfulness. Lord, we just praise your name. We praise your name because you are worthy of praise. Fill us with this calm joy. Help us to understand and recognize no matter what's happening around us, we can have joy when we are with you. Help us to persevere through the pain, to recognize the struggle that we have, but to rejoice because of the promise that you give us, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, and that you're coming back for us for eternity. If anyone here today is struggling with pain, Lord, physical, mental, emotional, relational, psychological, spiritual, whatever pain they may be dealing with, Lord, I pray that you would help them to rejoice through it all because of the promise that you give us. In Jesus' name.